July 31st, 1978. My darling MacDolt, you said that things seem clearer when they are written down. Well, herewith a very boring letter in which I will try and put everything down so that you may read and reread it at horror. At your folly in getting involved with me. Deep breath. To begin with, I love you with a depth and passion that I have felt for no one else in this life. And if it astonishes you, it is astonishes me as well. No, I hasten to say because you are not worth of loving, far from it. It's just that, first of all, I swore I would not get involved with another woman. Secondly, I have never had such a feeling before and it is almost frightening. Thirdly, I would never have thought it possible that another human being could occupy my waking and sleeping thoughts to the exclusion of almost everything else. Fourthly, I never thought that even if one was in love, one could get so completely besotted with another person so that a minute away from them felt like a thousand years. Fifthly, I never hoped, aspired, dreamed that one could find everything one wanted in a person. I was not such an idiot as to believe this was possible, yet in you I have found everything I want. You are beautiful, gay, giving, gentle, idiotically and deliciously feminine, sexy, wonderfully intelligent and wonderfully silly as well. I want nothing else in this life than to be with you. To listen and watch you, your beautiful voice, your beauty, to argue with you, to laugh with you, to show you things and share things with you, to explore your magnificent mind and to explore your wonderful body, to help you, protect you, serve you and bash you on the head when I think you are wrong. Not to put too fine a point on it, I consider myself the only man outside mythology to have found a crock of gold at the rainbow's end. But, having said all that, let us consider things in details. Don't let this thing become public, but, well, I have one or two faults. Minor ones, I hasten to say. For example, for example, I am inclined to be overbearing. I do it for the best possible motives, all tyrants say that, but I do tend, without thinking, to tread people underfoot. You must tell me when I am doing it to you, my sweet, because it can be a very bad thing in a marriage. Right. Second blemish. This actually is not so much a blemish of character as a blemish of circumstances. Darling, I want you to be you in your own right and I will do everything I can to help you in this. But you must take into consideration that I'm also me in my own right and that I have a head start on you. What I'm trying to say is that you must not feel offended if you are sometimes treated simply as my wife. Always remember that what you lose on the swings, you gain on the roundabout. I am an established creature in the world and so, on occasion, you will have to live in my shadow. <laughs> Nothing gives me less pleasure than this, but it is a fact of life to be faced. Third, and very important and nasty blemish, jealousy. I don't think you know what jealousy is, thank God in the real sense of the word. I know you have felt jealousy over Lincoln's wife and child, but this is what I call normal jealousy. And this, to my regret, is not what I've got. What I've got is a black monster that can pervert my good sense, my good humor, and any goodness that I have in my makeup. It is a really, a Jekyll and Mr. Hyde situation. My Hyde is stronger than my good sense and defeats me, hard though I try. As I told you, I have always known that this lurks within me, 
but I couldn't control it and my monster slumbered and nothing happened to awake it. Then I met you and I felt my monster stir and become half awake when you told me of Lincoln and others you have known and with your letter my monster came out of its lair. Black, irrational, begotted, stupid, evil, malevolent. You will never know how terribly corrosive jealousy is. It's a physical pain as though you had swallowed acid or red hot coals. It is the most terrible of feelings, but you can't help it. At least I can't. And God knows I've tried. I don't want any ex-boyfriend sitting in a church when I marry you. On our wedding day, I want nothing but happiness for both you and me. And I know I won't be happy if there is a church full of your ex-conquests. When I marry you, I will have no past, only a future. I don't want to drag my past into our future and I don't want you to do it either. Remember, I am jealous of you because I love you. You are never jealous of something you don't care about. Okay, enough about jealousy. Now, let me tell you something. I have seen thousands of sunsets and sunrises on land where it floods forests and mountains with honey-colored light, at sea where it rises and sets like blood orange in a multicolored nest of cloud, slipping in and out on the vast ocean. I have seen a thousand moons, harvest moons like gold coins, winter moons as white as ice chips, new moons like baby swans feathers, I have watched tigers like flames mating in the long grass. I've been dive bombed by an angry raven, black and glossy as the devil's hoof. I have lain in the water warm as milk, soft as silk, while around me played a host of dolphins. I have met a thousand animals and seen a thousand wonderful things, but all this I did without you. This was my loss. All this I want to do with you. This will be my gain. All this I would gladly have forgone for the sake of one minute of your company, for your laugh, your voice, your eyes, hair, lips, body, and above all, for your sweet, ever surprising mind which is an enchanting quarry in which is my privilege to delve.